Alexander Ashton from Oxford uh, with a title Bodies from the Sea, Metaplasticity and the Boundaries of Social Cognition in the Aegean Bronze Age. Hello. Um, thank you very much for having me. I suppose this is working, yeah? Good. All right. Um, yeah, thank you. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing everyone's presentations. Everything just looks fantastic. Uh, and thank you for organizing the conference. It's just great. <laughs> All right. So with no further ado, let's do some cognitive archaeology. <clears throat> My research is motivated by three primary questions. First, on a broad intellectual level, I wish to explore robust explanations of social structure as ecological and evolutionary phenomena while avoiding the pitfalls of reductionism. Second, on a disciplinary level, I wish to explore how cognitive archaeology might contribute to our understanding of social organization. And third, I'm specifically researching the cognitive and ecological dimensions of early Bronze Age social complexity through the application of material engagement and niche construction theory to the development of Cycladic figurines, ritual, and regional identity in the Aegean. <clears throat> the emergence of the Bronze Age is a key phase transition in human social organization. Communities began to operate and interact at new scales, transforming flows of energy and matter across vast trade networks while concentrating and managing those flows within new centers of complexity. Perhaps the most common feature of these dynamics across Eurasia was a powerful tendency to develop into societies with persistent structural inequalities expressed as heritable identities. In order to examine the ecological and cognitive dimensions of the Aegean Bronze Age, I first want to go over the basic theoretical foundations of this talk. This brings me to the concept of niche construction and ecosystem engineering, or the way in which organisms modify flows of energy and matter as a form of ecological inheritance that produces co-evolutionary feedback. Organisms, such as beavers and termites, modify their environments to shape the conditions in which they develop and have in turn develop, evolved to inhabit the environments they create. The key impact of niche constructing behavior is that it selects for developmental plasticity while producing powerful downstream effects in the broader environment. In this light, humans can be seen as the preeminent example of a niche constructing organism. <clears throat> However, if coevolutionary feedback with a modified environment selects for plasticity, the logical, ex logical extreme of this is a radical suppression of selective changes. The unique properties of human evolution have resulted in such a high degree of plasticity that we are capable of reconfiguring our developmental environments multiple times within a single generation. That is to say, we create what might be understood as cognitive developmental niches that are socially and materially distributed. This brings me to the concept of metaplasticity as formulated in material engagement theory by my advisor Lambrus Malaforis. This is defined as the synergetic feedback between neural, behavioral, and material plasticity that allows humans to reconfigure their cognitive development, and cognitive dynamics and development through material culture and modification of the environment. It is this dynamic in human cognitive evolution that I believe helps to explain the radical changes in human development without any major selective changes in the past 200 millennia. That is, Renfrew's sapient paradox. Focusing on the Kikladis during the Aegean Neolithic Bronze Age transition, my research examines the emergence of Bronze Age complexity as a long-term process of cognitive developmental niche construction. During this process, I argue millennia of ecosystem engineering began to exert novel pressures upon social and cognitive development. In these regards, I examine the emergence of structural inequality during the Bronze Age as inherently a problem of social cognition, that is, a problem of the ways in which people conceptualize and think through relationships with others. It is a twofold problem. Communities had to learn how to manage the scalar stresses created by intensifying interactions within and between increasingly large collectivities, all while finding ways of maintaining social coherence between identities caught up in increasingly asymmetrical relationships. To exemplify this process, I'm looking at the development of Cycladic marble sculpting, chronologically graphed on this slide, 
as a technology that worked to reconfigure the boundaries of social cognition, enabling Cycladic Islanders to organize on a regional scale through a collectively performed and ecologically distributed identity. The plasticity and luminosity and durability of marble make it a potent source of metaplastic feedback. At the height of the early Bronze Age, that is, during the middle of the third millennium BC, Cycladic Islanders developed a cultural regime of long-range canoe voyaging that connected the Aegean world, as this map illustrates. Prefiguring the intensive maritime networks of later periods, new materials and energetic flows began to circulate throughout the region, binding together communities on Crete, mainland Greece, and Anatolia. At the core of this dynamic was the movement of Cycladic longboats, and within this core were flows of marble that bound the island communities together in what Renfrew has labeled the Confederacy of Keros. As revealed from recent excavations by the Cambridge Keros project, figurines and other materials were brought from across the archipelago, ritualistically destroyed, and deposited on the island of Keros for roughly five centuries. The deposition of the figurines and graves has long shown that community identity was implicated in their use. However, the discovery of the sanctuary on Keros reveals that Cycladic sculpture was mediating social relationships across the islands, permeating boundaries between local and regional identities. To understand how the complex emerged from the simple, it is necessary to explore how long-term environmental modification transformed relationships of value and meaning in the early Cycladic environment. Neolithic communities, most likely from the Eastern Aegean, began to occupy the Cycladis during the 5th millennium BC. Saliago's peoples had a distinct ecological strategy of establishing central village sites on alluvial plains near large bays. Mainland practices were essentially imported wholesale to the archipelago, but involved a shift from wheat to barley cultivation and a pronounced expansion of capra vines from roughly 50% of mainland faunal assemblages to around 80% on the islands. Villages are estimated to have supported between 70 to 150 people and persisted between two and four centuries. It is among the sites of the Saliagos culture that the earliest engagements with marble have been discovered. This includes finds of smooth pebbles, schematic carvings, and naturalistic depictions similar to those found in terracotta throughout the Aegean Neolithic. The general picture of the Neolithic occupation of the Cycladis is one of site abandonments. The settlement pattern was essentially a process of inceptive niche construction through re relocation that remained viable for around 1,500 years. However, two significant factors complicate this strategy demographic growth, and environmental change. The expansion and nucleation of communities would have produced an increasingly complex network of kinship groups spreading across the islands while steadily reducing the amount of land available for new settlement. Over time, this would have created pressures to extend the use life of settlements as well as to reoccupy abandoned areas more rapidly. All of this would have contributed to intensifying ecological impacts as Cycladic peoples cleared land for grazing, planting, and construction. It is salient to note that the 3rd millennium BC was a period of general aridification throughout the entire Mediterranean basin, and that analysis of the Aegean has shown severe erosion events tended to occur within 500 to 1,000 years from the introduction of agriculture. Thus, toward the end of the Neolithic, Cycladic islanders were undoubtedly experiencing both more complex social reality as well as downstream impact from millennia of ecosystem engineering. Neolithic lifeways that had persisted in the islands for nearly two millennia were drastically reorganized with the onset of the early Bronze Age. Abandoning their central villages, Cycladic peoples dispersed into farmsteads and small hamlets scattered across the landscape. It is during this period that the smaller islands of the Cycladis were first occupied. The settlements of the god Apelos culture likely ranged between one and five families and appear to have been abandoned and relocated every few generations. Paul Halstead has argued that population dispersal in the Aegean Neolithic likely entailed shifts towards more flexible mixtures of horticulture and pastoralism. An intensified focus upon herding helps explain the mobility of these communities in the, in the landscape, as well as a mechanism for the accumulation of wealth inequalities into households. Nonetheless, 
All of these changes would have distributed ecological impact and risk more evenly while raising the overall productive capacity of the region. <clears throat> this pattern of habitation persisted for roughly 500 years before large central villages with populations ranging around 300 persons began to aggregate and the voyaging cultures of the early Bronze Age emerged. It is in the reorganizations of the Grotto Pilos phase that I believe the foundations of early Cycladic social complexity were first established. Dispersal into farmsteads would have significantly reconfigured the dynamics and burdens of social cognition. As Cypriot Brubank has argued, the vulnerability of communities moving to marginal environments would have been mediated through social storage networks. In other words, a form of counteractive niche construction through the cultivation of social relationships, obligations, and debts that offset environmental risks. The existence of such networks, as Broodbank has demonstrated, is supported by the clear need for exogamy in such communities. Under these conditions, group life would have become more intensely localized within the family, while issues of territory and use rights, particularly in terms of pasturage, would have required renegotiating. In short, the distributed, fluid, and interdependent structure of Grotopilos communities would have sharply increased the difficulty and necessity of orienting, tracking, and maintaining social relationships in the environment. The appearance of grave sites and naturalistic figurines during this period appears to be a crucial way in which the complexity was navigated. The argument that cemeteries are a means of establishing social biography and territorial claims in a landscape of their own. In this light, burials can be understood as a form of memory or ecological inheritance embedded into the environment. However, the efflorescence of sculpting has a number of implications upon cognitive development in Grotopilo society. Clearly, their form and deposition in grave context show that they were involved in social identity and metaphors of the body. That is to say, the conceptual blending of marble and particularly female bodies helped to support new forms of value and meaning. In particular, the two major traditions of the Grotopilus culture, the Plasteris and Loro styles, each place a distinctly different emphasis on the body, individuating and generalizing the body respectively. It is from these observations that I will argue that the development of Cycladic sculpting traditions scaffolded and articulated conceptions of identity and relationality at several different spatial and temporal scales. In the succeeding Kairos-Syros cultural phase, the Cycladic sculpting tradition stabilized into the canonical folded arm female figurines, which Renfrew has described as the logo of the Cycladis. I argue that marble fueled a metaplastic dynamic in which the plasticity and durability of the material produced perceptual, neural, and behavioral feedback that worked to reshape the development of cognition. On the individual level, in skillment and marble sculpting would clearly influence identity formation. Importantly, the brain has distinct neural activation patterns in response to the perception of bodies, particularly in the extrastriate and fusiform body areas of the brain. FMRI studies have shown that there is an overlap between motor skills, proprioception, attentional capture, and body perception. The studies indicate that as sculptors began to elicit patterns from marble, Numerous layers of self-reinforcing feedback encourage the further development of form and identity. Moving from individual engagement with marble, it's important to consider the role of the figurines as participants in a collective developmental environment. At the height of the early Bronze Age, the canonical figurines emerge as self-similar body schema depicted in marble, a generalized form that could be individuated through paint with tattoo-like markings and depictions of jewelry. However, it is the ubiquitous painting of large, forward-gazing eyes during the Kairos-Syros phase that is perhaps the most radical innovation of the figurines. Studies have shown eyes are central to the neural activation patterns involved in facial perception and attentional capture. It is understood that perception of eyes developmentally precedes other patterns of facial processing and are critical to the gaze following that directs attentional focus beginning in infancy. Human intersubjectivity begins to develop, to de develop in the first year of life through focus and mimicking of the face, particularly the eyes, and mimicking facial expressions, followed by gaze following and joint attention upon objects in pragmatic context by the second year of life. 
Depictions of eyes, furthermore, have been shown to activate attentional focus even in the absence of other features. And there are specific cellular clusters in the left amygdala that are responsive only to eyes. It is also noteworthy that visual saccades involved in facial recognition center upon the bridge of the nose, the only facial feature elicited in marble on the canonical sculptures. Moreover, neurophysical studies have shown that perception of bodies, faces, and eyes all have profound attention capturing effects. There are several neural structures in the brain that are highly responsive to the perception of bodies, body parts, and faces, playing critical roles in identification, perception, uh, and emotional states, intentions, and more. I would like to argue that these perceptual properties of figurines produce feedback which shaped cognitive development. To this end, I thought it would be useful and fun to offer you empirical evidence that faces have profound effects upon perception. Some of you have come across this before, but if you have not, please stare at the cross on the center of the screen. People starting to see the distortions. All right, it's weird. <clears throat> it's not quite, quite clear why this optical illusion has the effect upon perception that it does. However, I believe part of what is occurring is that the various aspects of our perceptual systems, which are responsive to faces, are competing for attentional focus due to the unique configuration of the illusion. Regardless, this illusion illustrates the potent effects that body, human bodies and faces can have upon perception. I believe that the attention caption properties of the figurines helps to explain how Cycladic sculpture mediated the development of social cognition. I therefore would like to posit that the qualities of Kikladi figurines supported the development of shared attentional, intentional, and emotive states through metaphors of the body that flexibly articulated between individuality and collectivity. By looking at the development of the figurines as part of long-term ecological changes in the organization of bodies and communities, I argue that the sculptures functioned as a form of kinship in technology, an intersubjective developmental scaffold that allowed for identity and social relationships to be conceptualized at emergent scales, thus becoming a form of ecological memory and inheritance that was collectively maintained through ritual practice. In this way, the sculptures can be seen as a cognitive technology that enabled Kikladic Islanders to mediate social identities amid the scalar stresses and growing inequalities of the early Bronze Age. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. I did, I, did I just rush it? Excellent. <laughs> excellent timing, which is great. So we have time for questions.